Welcome everybody to Clearwater Jazz Holidays Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. We are recording these sessions for the, for the purposes of Clearwater Jazz Holiday Education and Outreach. Today's educator and guest musicians are Frank Williams and Tyler Wortman, and their topic is Scale Pattern Practice Alternate Positions for Trombone. Everybody is muted upon entry to these sessions. We appreciate your cooperation to remain muted for the courtesy of the session. If you have a specific question, please feel free to use the chat feature or the raise your hand feature and we'll get those questions to Tyler and to Frank. All these upcoming sessions are listed at clearwaterjazz.com education. And you can see all the upcoming topics and Zoom information to join each session. And we have a new resource on clearwaterjazz.com's education and outreach page. We call it the studio. The studio archives all the past sessions, the topics, resources relating to those topics, and soon all of the full recorded sessions will be available for you to review for free, courtesy of Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation. They're organized by instrument, so check out the studio on our education and outreach page and uh, soon this session will be added to them as well. If you have feedback regarding this session, or if you would like us to cover a specific topic, please email those suggestions and that feedback to info at clearwaterjazz.com. That's I-N-F-O at clearwaterjazz.com. Frank Williams and Tyler Wortman are no strangers to Clearwater Jazz Holiday Education and Outreach. Frank is a very special education partner who has helped us to develop many of our outreach programs. Frank is uh, not only the director of the jazz program at Ruth Eckerd Hall, which we have supported for years, but he is also instrumental in the development and delivery of all kinds of innovative Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation programming, including our History of Jazz Education Outreach Program, My Journey with Jazz Program, and Young Lions Jazz Master Sessions. Frank is an educator with, with well over 40 years teaching experience as a band director, conductor, adjudicator, clinician, composer, and author. He's a multi-instrumentalist, but his primary instrument and in love is the trombone. If you would like to check out some of the things Frank has authored, we recommend that you search down Carl, Carl Fisher Music recently published his method book, Chops, The Ultimate Guide to Building Tone, Technique, and Flexibility, which is available for both trumpet and trombone. Tyler Wortman is also special to Clearwater Jazz Holiday Education and Outreach, participating in our My Journey with Jazz programs, Young Lions Jazz Master Sessions, and History of Jazz programs. He is a composer, performer, producer, focused on jazz and classical styles. He performs with many groups and ensembles, which has taken him on many special travels, and he has worked with some really awesome people. He's just an all-around super dude, and we are happy to have Tyler with us. So Tyler and Frank, thank you for being a special part of these virtual sessions. The stage is all yours. Okay, okay, okay. How are you doing, Tyler? Man, I'm doing good. How are you? I'm wonderful, man. Look, I want to throw a monkey wrench in this thing right off the top, okay? Okay. So we talk about a lot of things when we talk about uh, scale patterns and whatnot, right? Yes, sir. But one of, the, one of my favorite patterns we didn't talk about, and that is the pattern uh, that you find in the Clark book. We call it the Clark pattern. Ah, you know what yes. about? If we did not yeah. talk about, no, we didn't. <laughs> and it's one of the best ones for gaining a facility on the instrument, do you know what I mean? And uh, um, I always did these uh, in every key chromatically. I generally started with F down in sixth position. Yes. And Absolutely. then work it up, up the G flat to G and just work it as far up the range as I could, sometimes going as high as uh, B flat uh, contra is the uh, at the bottom of high B flat, uh, we could take it up, you know, substantially to a double F. But that was in my younger days. <laughs> sure, sure. We were now, would you practice this? pattern there. Yes. Now, would you practice this, uh, the, the Clark? Because uh, there's a few different exercises with the Clark stuff. The one I like yes. is the one, two, three, one, two. Three, four, two, three, four, 
five, three, one, two, three, one. And then it goes two, three, four, two, and then it goes seven, one, two, seven, and then it changes again, one, three, two, one, two, four, three, two, one. That's my jazz version of it. Yes? Okay. And so you got a whole key covered in that short period of time. Now, you would, you practice this? would you practice yeah. with, with one articulation? Or would you maybe try to, to, you know, maybe do a staccato, do practice your legato tonguing? or Always a variation of all of those. Uh, Sometimes I would concentrate on one particular articulation, and sometimes I would simply alter articulations or alternate articulations as it went up. The first one might be marcalto, the second one might be staccato, the third one might be legato. You know what I mean? I might do a jazz, a jazz style, I mean, just kind of accent upbeats. There's just all kind of ways you do it. Um, but depending on what my needs were for the week and um, what I had done previously, I try to make sure that I had covered all bases within the cycle of the week. Yeah. But that's one of my favorite ones. And um, it just it helped with a lot of effect, lots of, uh, how shall I say this, uh, finesse on the instrument. You know what Absolutely. I mean? All the keys, to get all the bad slide movements and everything else. And um, it's one that everyone knows, but not a lot of people do it on trombone. But um, very, very appropriate for trombone. Yeah. I found it in that book, uh, Practice with the Experts. That's and right. I always tell people that uh, if you can't, it's online now. It's been out of print for maybe 30, 40 years. So it is online uh, for download. And if anyone wants it and cannot find it, contact me through Clearwater Jazz Holiday, and I will make it available to you because I most certainly keep copies of it on my phone and all my devices because I am on a mission to distribute that to everyone I know that plays the trombone, okay? And, and I have that copy, and I, I treat it as a Bible, essentially. Of course you have that copy. You know me, don't you? It, it, it's protected, <laughs> is what I'm saying. It, it's very protected. Now, exactly. now with, with the Clark study, something I practice as well as as well as the varied tempos, varied articulation, yeah. um, also, very uh, keys you, you know a lot of pe players play this in major um yeah, yeah, yeah. also uh very instructive to try you yeah. know your minor keys as yeah. well as maybe a whole tone scale yeah. To, yeah. to approach yeah. these different sounds as well as practicing that facility that you're talking about yeah yeah, yeah. You, you can always alter the third or fifth or whatever you want to do, you know, I mean, you can make it any form you want to. Obviously, the major is a form you find it in more than any other. And for the budding player, uh, the major is probably going to be more of a challenge than what they really want to tackle. But once you have that secure, then yeah, let's order the third. That's what we can do with that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. And then melodic minor, you know, having yeah. a natural seven with, yeah. with the minor yeah. third. Yeah. All we're doing yeah. is manipulating one note. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. for the basic structure, and um, and from there yeah. we can open up a whole new sound based off of um, a major exercise here. Right. Well, this this exercise unfortunately only had the conference of one to five, so right. always one, three, and five. So we can do majors, we can do minors, we can do diminished, we can do augmented, perhaps. You know what I mean? But uh, it does not give you the compass of working up to sixes or sevens or any of those. That particular exercise does not. Some of the other things that we're going to be dealing with would most certainly allow for that, yes. Now, also in these practices, since we know how, they, how the B flat major scale sounds, okay, sure. would this be a good time to start implementing these alternate positions in the practice? Since we know how a B flat sounds in first, why not start it from? Um, you know, the B flat on top of the, the bass clef staff in fifth position, um, practicing with the alternate fourth, just to sort of strengthen not only our ear, but um, the understanding of that connection from the slide to the embouchure. Yeah, yeah I, I have a kind of a, uh, well, let me kind of explain my, 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 my little journey here. 
when I taught uh, privately way back in, in the 70s, I mean, I'm a pretty old guy here. There was a book that was very popular by a guy named Walter Beaver. Have you ever seen that book? I don't it's think a I have. Yeah, not many people have seen it. It's a beginning and intermediate trombone book. And I do mean a beginning book, okay? And he introduces all the positions in the beginning book. It is, a, it is the only book I've ever seen deal with the trombone that treats it that way. And I think I became familiar with, it, with this particular book because I had my uh, study for my master's at State University of New York at Fredonia. And at one point he had been the trombone professor at that particular school. So everyone's very familiar with his work. Right. But he felt that earlier you, you introduced alternate positions to a student, uh, the more uh, comfortable they were with him. Uh, people may know uh, the great uh, Robert Mayer, who was the uh, uh, principal oboist in Chicago for many, many years. And uh, he retired to uh, St. Petersburg. And in my early days in the 80s uh, at Boca Ciega, all of my students uh, studied with him. Matter of fact, all the first year players, all the all-state bands studied with Robert Mayer. I mean, he was like clearly the president of the oboe. I remember him telling me that he started all of his oboe students with the G flat major scale. And I go, what? Why would you do that? He says, well, look at it. If you start them with the G flat, they think it's an easy scale. And that way, once you start teaching them the F and the B flat, it's totally even easier, for God's sake. Why cripple a kid? I went, Really? He goes, yeah. So it was the same kind of philosophy as Robert, uh, as uh, uh, Walter Beeler. Let's introduce what most people think is a foreign entity, uh, Arthur Trombone, uh, Arthur right. Trombone, uh, to as early as possible. Now, in terms of specific exercises, I always like to do the Arthur positions. Okay. In the most logical manner, I, I never, there are exercises that allow you to practice the, the alternate positions as a exercise in and of itself, where you might play B flat in first, then match with B flat in fifth, and go back and forth, maybe with half notes, then the quarter notes, then the eighth notes, so you are quickening that pace and got less time to actually match that pitch or try to maintain that pitch. You can do it with a tuner at first, and then later on with just the ear once you got a little bit more um, oral acuity going on. Uh, you know, so you would start out with the F, F, F in first, F in sixth, B flat in first and uh, fifth, uh, the D in first and fourth and seventh, E flat in third and sixth, and just work up those alternations that way. That's just an exercise to become comfortable where those notes actually lay on the slide, what they feel like to find the approximate proper intonation for those particular alternative or alternate positions. However, in practice, my theory has always been that you keep the slide moving in the same direction at all times, as much as possible. If you're moving the slide this way, keep it moving. If you're moving the slide this way, keep it moving. And always go to the closest position. Therefore, if I'm playing a B flat major scale, I go from one to three. I'm not going back to first for the D. Number one, and it's changing the direction of the slide. Why do that? Keep moving. Also, the next note I play is E flat, which is in third position. D is the alternative to first flat D. Therefore, the most logical thing for you to do is go one, three, four, and then the three. I've done two things. I kept the slide moving in the same direction for as long as I could, and I went to the closest position which for the E flat, which is the D. So when you use that kind of uh, technical uh, uh, knowledge, then, of course, you're starting to use the instrument as the instrument should be used. Something that people don't do is, okay, so if I play it that way, uh, Frank, you're in third position now. What are you going to do with that L? Well, I'm already moving back up the slide, so I should probably go to first and then to second, second, and then whatever for the high B flat. But you know what? I could just as well go to four with the L 
and then fourth for the G, and then fourth for the A, and then at the fifth maybe for the B flat, or the third, or the first. There are all sorts of alternatives, and I tell people the two rules are simple. Keep the slide moving in the same direction as much as possible, and move to the closest position. So there are two things here. We practice all the positions as an exercise in and of itself to clarify where these notes are for proper intonation and proper tone. Because we're playing higher in the overtone series to match tone is also important, the timbre of the sound. That is important as an exercise unto itself. But when applying them to trombone technique, you always want to make sure the slide moves in the same direction as much as possible and you're going to the closest position you find, especially among jazz trombone players. Guys will be playing all these fine licks and you look and the slide is hardly moving. Man, how are you doing that? He's using alternate positions. JJ was very fine with it. And JJ loves to use third and fourth position because of all the notes and standard keys, B flat, E flat, et cetera, that you can find in those two positions. He was just very, very great at that. So, I mean, there were guys that play very, very quickly, very, very technically, very, very accurately, who hardly ever go past fourth position because they know on that well. And of course, the higher you go, the more alternatives you have. I'll shut up now. <laughs> no, you, you hit so many great points. Uh, and so I'll, I'll sort of backtrack with that. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just love this stuff and no, so I get I love going. It. I love it. You hit you hit so many great points. Uh, so you talked about these these great players that can play very quickly. I had a lesson with a student this week. He's doing a Frank Rosalino transcription. Oh yeah. yeah. Now Frank, he does yeah. a lot of that same alternate uh, movement to keep the slide going in one direction. If you're trying oh, yeah. to play it up with all natural position, oh yeah, you're gonna have a bad time. Oh yeah. You have to have these alternates. And not only his alter his alternates are, are a certain um, way, but his his um, his turns, for instance. Oh, yeah. Frank's yeah. his turns are very different. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so yeah. Yeah. without talking about that too much, uh, that that's for another topic. You no, no about but seriously, in that practice of the experts book. Sure, sure. Okay. Frank Rosalino does three pages on turns alone. Mm. Braid up, 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 Bob in every key. So it almost sounds like he's he's like it's it's almost a tongue method or like a slur tongue method, but he just has that facility. He 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 uh the first slur is tap with the tongue for sure, but everything else is air and lip. Oh yeah, you can hear that attack initially. But then yeah. his control upon that is, is remarkable. Yeah, it's, and it's all just lip and slide movement and air, man. And sometimes he does the thing that jazz trombone players do. And sometimes when he should use a legato tongue, because right. he's playing in the same mode of resonance and a slide, you know, going from a lower note to a high note in the same mode of resonance, you get a glissando if you do that, right? But he will do it so fast that you won't hear the glissando. Uh, you won't even hear it. So uh, he had a lot of tricks. He, he really did. Um, and wonderful tricks. He's one of the most um, fun trombone players to study. Uh, okay. Just amazing a player and a real good a sense of swing and humor in everything he yeah. And he approaches the, the trombone as a trombonist, not as a yeah. jazz trombone. He's playing all yeah. over the horn. That's uh, right. And, That's uh, right. That's so you also talked about a few other great points here, Frank. I just want to touch on these. You talked all about right. the tone series with alternate positions. Now, um, as we know, the alternate, you know, playing an F in first position, it feels a certain way on trombone. Now, yeah. playing an F in sixth position, it seems like that's it's a lot more tubing to go through. Um, right. and getting familiar 
with how that feels, you know, on your partial is very important, not only for, for muscle memory in your slide, but muscle memory for your embouchure. Um, yes. To understand how much air is needed to, to get a good sound there. Yeah. The, the, the one thing I, I would like to, I always tell kids, look, the horn tells you what it needs. Right. Me. I say, okay. So you're in first position, right? Do you right. see the end of your slide? Well, yeah. Okay, put it in four. You see how much longer the horn is now? Okay, in order to have the same sound in fourth and seven first, we must compensate for the increased length of the instrument. Oh, now go to six. Wow, man, that's a big difference. Oh, yeah, baby. Which means now we got to have even more dia diaphragm support if you were to make the F in six sound anything like the F in first. And also understand that when you're playing the F in fourth, you're one partial above where F sits in first. When you're playing the F in six, you are two partials above. So look at that. When you're playing the F in six, what you're actually playing is a high B flat that has been slid out to an F. Oh, yeah, that's right. So there's all of that compensation as well. And um, that's one of the more beautiful things about the trombone. With a valve instrument, a trumpet or trombone, you can't see those tubing lengths so well because they're valves and you can see the curve linear, but whatever. With a trombone, oh, it's right there. You yeah. can see the instrument adjusting its length. And you have to understand that in order to get the same sound, you got to fill this tubing with the same amount of air pressure throughout. So that's where we are. Sure. And so that brings us into range building. Okay. So you talked about if you could play an F in the first position, uh, two ledge lines above the staff, you can practically play a high B flat if we're putting the alternate position, sixth position on it and working on that increased airspeed, then yeah. we can actually, all we have to do is just move the slide up and keep yeah. that airspeed going. Well, people break because it's, because it's, it's as mental as it is physical. Uh, it, it, yeah. You know, I used to tell that. I, I, yeah. How many kids have you ever seen that could play an A flat but not a B flat? And you go, it's just a step away. What? Oh, it's B flat. You gotta get over that. B flat. It's one right? step apart. That's it. It's not like it's a, it's a mile away. It's hardly any movement. The air's a little faster. Blah, blah, blah. Let's do it. So that, that gets to, uh, there are two parts of range. One is physical and one is absolutely mental. Mm -hmm. And I really think that the one that's more difficult to get past is the mental. Um, I've always heard people say, if you want to play high notes, play down to them. Which means if you're looking up at it, you're probably going to miss it. If you try to overplay it, you're probably going to play it. You know what I mean? So um, one of the things I do, just to kind of back up a little bit here, one of the things I've done uh, with private students, with drum and bugle corps in the early days, so I was building a young horn line for Suncoast Sound of all that. Kids and I have a lot of power, not a lot of skills, not a lot of range, anything. I did this thing, I think, in that book, it's by Dick Nash, and I called it progressive slurs. And basically, everything is done in one breath, and you can do it in all and down the slide, or you can just do it in first position. You just according to how much time you have and what you really want to do. I suggest you do it at least first, second, third, fourth position, and it is much better if you do all seven positions. But let's do at least first, second, third, fourth. You start on B flat, and you go only to F, and you lift third up, and you crescendo from a piano to a triple F by the end of the, the, that F. And then you add two note B flat. And you do the same thing. You do a shindo and lift up through it, 
And by the time you get to the B flat, you're at triple 40. And then you add the D. So now it's low B flat, L, B flat, D. Same thing. One breath, piano to triple four J, and you add the L. You might even add the A flat, although you, we both know it's a, not a usable note. You know what I mean? Uh, but when you're in second, you can actually adjust the position and make it G usable. But you may do that just for practice, you know? Right. And then, of course, you add the B flat and then wherever else you want to go. But the point is, you cannot do this exercise and allow yourself to go from a piano to a forte to a mental piano once you get higher. You must continue to play with increased power. That is going to build all of the armature muscles, especially the anchor right here, the chin, all of that. And it's also going to build lung capacity as well. So pretty much you're adding a note on the overtone series with every rep. You're still doing it in one breath. You go from piano to triple forte in that one breath. And the end of the last note you play is the loudest sound you make. And that is going to build real strength in upper range. That's one of them. Another one of my favorite is the basic pentatonic blues scale. A B flat pentatonic blues scale. So on low F, we paint it in B flat. So you go low F to B flat, D flat, E flat, F, A flat, B flat. And then you go back to low F and add the D flat. And then back to low F and add the E flat. And then back to low F and add the F. Now you got a two octave situation. And then back to low elf and add the A flat. And what happens is, as you get to a point that you can go a little further, you don't stop. Sure. You back down to the elf, then down to the E flat, then down to the E flat, then down to whatever, until you end on the single low F. So it's like opening up an accordion and closing it back down. Okay. The idea is to continue to add one of those notes. Get to the high B flat, add the D flat. Get the D flat happen, add the E flat. Right. The idea is to be able to go from a low L to super B flat. I'll teach one bit. That's the idea. Some days you'll get it. Some days won't be your day. Okay, so I only made it to the F today. Fine. I get onto the E flat, I go down to the D flat, and I go down to the B flat. It forces you not to just stop, but to complete the cycle all the way back down to the low elf. And of course, start ending on the low elf. You're going to relax those chops, get some blood flowing in there, and not allow you to do damage to the chops. And once again, this is also found in that practice with the experts. And that particular exercise is by a guy named Sy Zentner, who had a very, very, very beautiful sound, uh, very lyrical. Uh, in the upper register. So um, everything I know, I stole from somebody else. <laughs> well, at least you said it. A lot of people oh, don't say it. <laughs> I, uh, hey, I don't know anything. I I came here just like everybody else, a little baby, didn't know anything. So everything I know, I stole from somebody else. <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, let's yeah. let's hit uh, this this last topic here. I have expanded intervals as as an exercise. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah and that's yeah, similar yeah. to what you were saying about the interval practice, as we're uh, adding yeah. one onto the other. But yeah. can you talk about the expanded intervals for a little? Yeah, and uh, it was an uh, exercise that um, I use for is not just establishing the range, but how shall I say this? Making yourself more accurate in the upper range and also improving the ear, et cetera. So basically, we could choose a key, any key. One of the first notes I had trouble with on my horn was A flat, just below the high B flat. Who knows? 
something in the metal, whatever, I don't know. It was just a stuffy note. Sure. And um, this exercise, I was taught on low A flat, and I played the A flat major scale. But I will always return to the low A flat. So it's A flat to B flat to A flat to C to A flat to D flat, etc. You get to the first octave, you take a little break, and then you continue. Low A flat to B flat, now you're doing a ninth. Or A flat to C, D flat, E flat, F, G, A flat. Now you got a two octave exercise, okay? When I come down, I will start on the high A flat. Then I'll go A flat to G, half step, A flat to F, got it? A flat to E flat, so I've now reversed the cycle. At first, I'm expanding and uh, from the bottom to the top. Now I'm expanding from top down. Right. Are you following? Yes. Okay. And in that first octave top down, I lip slur all those intervals. The G is a lip slur. The F to A flat is a lip slur. The E flat to A flat is lip slur. So you're really mu using the muscularity and the air to create that upper octave you know, without benefit of the tongue. You understand what I'm saying? And then once I get into the second octave, I'll then add the tongue, or I'll reverse it. It's according to how I'm feeling about the practice that day. And I could do it in any key. If I had a problem with a high C, I would use that C for the day, C major scale, same thing. And it's a two octave exercise. The first half, you start from the low C and you return to it every time over that two octave scale. On the descend, you always repeat that high C, and so it's high C to the B to the A, to et cetera. So by the time you're done, you've played, oh man, about 15, 16 high Cs in a row. So by that time, it's in there or it's not, okay? But uh, that's one of the things I did to really, how should I say, solidify and clarify uh, that part of my range and it did not matter if I was working in the middle of the horn, which I call an A flat, or if I was working on a high D above, high D flat, whatever it was, I would choose that particular major uh, key and use that scale as a, uh, a expanding interval. Now, could I use a minor? Yes. Could I use a Dorian? Yes. Could I use a mixed Lillian? Yes. Could I mix it up to make it more interesting for myself? Yes. The idea is expanding intervals, expanding intervals, and on the descend, make sure your lips learn so that it is all about, how should I say, the taste of the notes. Mm. Without benefit of tongue. By taste, I'm talking about embouchure and air and ear. That's the taste. Taste of the notes. I love that. Taste of it, baby. What does it taste like? <laughs> And again, with uh, so the practice you talked about practicing your A flat major scale two yeah. octaves, this expanded yeah. interval practice. Yeah. Now, after going through the practice once, twice, three x amount of times, would you find it beneficial to maybe practice with that B flat in fifth position? Um, you know, D flat in fifth position, F in that that sharp four position. Since we know what it sounds like in our root positions now, absolutely. Absolutely. So perhaps coming back down rather than doing an A flat to G, I go A flat to G, A flat to F, one, three to four, three to four, you know what I mean? Three to three. I can go to D flat and fifth, the close one, two positions out. It's not the most optimum thing, but I can go A flat to C in third, then go A flat to B flat in fifth. Right. So yeah, there there are there are things you can do it in reason. I would not use a variation of more than three positions in that kind of a situation. Right. You, know, you know, let's not make it ridiculous, but if right. you're talking three positions, maybe on the outside four, if you really trying to clarify one particular uh, alternative uh, position for a note, that's fine. But uh, you, don't, you don't want to make it a circuit exercise. You want to make it an exercise that is practical that you can apply for playing. Yes. I love it. And taste in the notes. You want to taste those notes? You know me, man. <laughs> I, love that. I love that. I'm writing this down now. <laughs> yeah.
Thank you, Frank. It's been yeah, wonderful. it's amazing. I, I'm learning that, a lot from these, man. I'm sure everyone else is too. It's amazing. You and I were together all these years, and because you played in the Ruth Eckert Jazz Band, and I was conducting a jazz band, all these little trombonisms, I call it, we we hardly got into that stuff because it was always about swing. You tune out saxophone players, yeah. you know, doing some of this. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I'm not going to name any names. Yeah, going <laughs> to protect the guilty here. <laughs> no, but I love these isms, and, and they're things that not only trombonists can practice, but other musicians can apply to their instruments as well. You know, exactly, exactly. Let's face it, there's no instrument like a trombone. We're the only ones with a slide. Sure. Therefore, the technique we use and the kind of obstacles we have to overcome in order to have great facility and great sound on the instrument and also great intonation. Because one thing I say about that is the trombone is simply one continuous tuning slide that has advantages and disadvantages. If you press a valve, you're gonna at least get close. There are no guarantees you're gonna be close on the trombone. The advantage we have is you can press a valve and may not be able to get it perfect. You can most certainly find a perfect place on a trombone slide if ah. you have a perfect ear. So with the trombone, you're either perfect or you are fiercely imperfect. <laughs> I love it. Oh my God, I'm having fun, I'm sorry. <laughs> Me too. Uh, well, how much time we got? What else we got to do? Got any questions out there? What we got here? I'm looking down at the chat feature. I don't see any questions from the participants today. Have you guys reached a, a good stopping point or did you have any other ideas you wanted to cover before I close things out? Tyler, anything else on your list? I'm looking at my list while we're doing this. Yeah, we, we pretty much covered all the topics that we had for today. Um, as well as some other ones. So uh, I'm glad you, you talked about the Clark studies practice as well. Hey man, I do I do the best I can with the limited um, uh, brain tissue that remains. <laughs> um, looks like we did pretty good, man. Yes, sir. Well, looks I like we did pretty. I appreciate both of you participating in these sessions. We look forward to doing more with you. I know we've got some others coming. I have one more. What's that, Frank? I have one more. Oh, one more. Okay. As it relates to range building. Okay. One of the things that I remember was very important to me were two octave lip glissandos, where let's say we're in sixth position and we are lip slurring from sixth position C to C two octaves above, normally played in first or third position, but you can play it in six. You're lip slurring, but you're trying to catch every partial between those two. So the F to A to C to E flat to F to A, G, A, B flat to the C, trying to get them all as a rip. So it's a glissando, right? And basically you play it, you increase the speed of the air, you hold the C, and you lift it back down, and you move a half step up to the C sharp, and then to the D, and then to the E flat, and then to the E and the F. So pretty much, you're starting with a C. This is for people who already have a fairly good high D flat and trying to expand the range. Start with that C, two octaves. Move it to the D flat when you can, or C sharp. Move it to the D when you can, to the E flat, to the E, to the F, to the G flat, to the B flat. The idea is to get all the way up to two octaves from your tuning note, to the double B flat. Here's the thing. Like everything else, sometimes you're able to do the entire thing. Sometimes you'll only get as far as the F. And when you do, you go back to the E, which you've already played. You know you can do it because you just did it. And then to the E flat, and then to the D, and then to the D flat, and then to the C. You don't take any shortcuts, and then you do a series of pedal tones to loosen chop. Those are called lip glissandos, and they work. 
The idea is to go from mezzo forte to double forte at the top. Mezzo forte to double forte at the top, and that most certainly will help to improve your range because you're going to lip the sondo, which means you can't use too much pressure in order to do that. And another thing we do uh, often with high range is we try to use too much pressure, and then that cuts the lip off from its ability to vibrate, which defeats the purpose. These lip misandos will help encourage you not to use that kind of excessive pressure. Okay, now I'm done. Thank you for that, Mr. Williams. So. Um, if you're enjoying Frank and Tyler, they're coming back and uh, hopefully they'll be back often. We know that on June 29th and on July 13th, they have two other sessions scheduled. In June 29th, they're doing a session called Scale Mode Applications and on July 13th, an, uh, an approach at transcription. And so we look forward to having them back for that. Uh, we've got a bunch of great things scheduled for this week. Um, clearwaterjazz.com forward slash education. You can see we've got uh, Brandon Robertson with us tomorrow, Tuesday, June 23rd. Uh, topics called um, Tempos and Styles, How to Develop Endurance During a Performance, Great for Bass and Drums. We've got John O'Leary tomorrow, How to Develop Rhythmic Ideas to Improvise Better on the Piano. Uh, J.J. Padishaw on Thursday, Jazz and Blues, different branches of the same tree, uh, guitar session there, and a lot more sessions scheduled through July with more being added often. So please check out our education page. And again, as a reminder, there's a new link on the education page. It's called the studio. If you click on the studio, you'll see all the past session topics, materials related to them, and in short time, the full recordings of all of these sessions will be populated in one place for free. It's going to become a tremendous resource. Yeah, Frank. Yeah, man. I want to give a special shout out to Brandon Robertson. I watched his clinic uh, last week. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. He hit everything you're supposed to hit. Even Israel Crosby, who everybody's prayers should attempt, anyway, attempt to deal with. So shout out to uh, Mr. Robertson for doing just an outstanding, outstanding job. It was a great session. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Brandon. Um, we're looking forward. We've got so, so many wonderful and gifted people involved with everything we're doing. And we also thank our sponsors and supporters for helping to expand the reach of these sessions and in creating this resource for you, including the Al Downing Tampa Bay Jazz Association, um, who are doing some great things. And check out check out what the check them out on social media and some of the things that they're doing online is really cool. So Frank and Tyler, thank you for being with us. We look forward to having you again with us again soon. And for everybody participating today and out there, stay safe, be well and keep playing. All right, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Later.